First John is all about Christians having assurance of a personal faith in Christ. That you know that you know him. And that you know where you're going to spend eternity when this life is o'er. There are a number of distinguishing characteristics that uh, John shares with us on what it means to be an authentic Christian. An authentic Christian. One of them is that we have communion with Christ. Also that uh, when we sin, we are quick to confess that sin. Another characteristic of a person who really knows Christ is that we are committed to God's word. We also have compassion for each other as members of the body of Christ. Another characteristic is that there's a total change in our affections. Another is that we are able to comprehend God's truth. A further characteristic is that there's a conformity to Christ's likeness. We want to be like him. We want to be like him. We acknowledge the fact that uh, we will have conflict in the world. And then an additional characteristic of a Christ follower is that we will have confidence in prayer. Well, the one, the one that we're going to take a look at this morning is that as Christians, we will have a genuine compassion and concern for other Christians. Other Christians. We will love one another. Uh, if you want an interesting study that you can do on your own, you take your concordance and uh, go through the concordance and look up all the references where these words appear. One another. One another. I believe there's close to 50 times that those words appear. And each one of them is an instruction as to how we are to relate to each other as members of the family of God. We're to love one another. We're to pray for one another. We're to serve one another. We're to build one another up. And the list just goes on and on and on. It's a wonderful, wonderful study. And it's a great way to take your spiritual temperature and to see how you are doing as a Christ follower. Words can be used in, in use for such a long time that they, they lose their meaning or sense of meaning. They lose their significance. They, they wear out. Uh, sometimes we say, well, I, I love that hat. Or uh, I love that tie. Isn't that a pretty tie? Yeah. Don't get jealous about it. It's just... <laughs> I love my car. Love my car. I love baked beans. Uh, I love my wife. That's an interesting comparison, isn't it? Baked beans and your wife. Well, one or the other is devalued when you use those comparisons. But do you really know what love is? Do you really know what love is? The Bible teaches us that God is love. And to know Jesus Christ personally is to know God's love. In describing the life that is real, John uses three words repeatedly. And those words are life, love, and light. In John's mind, those three words go together. Life, love, and light. He devotes three sections of this letter to the subject of Christian love. 
And uh, we have those passages listed for you. We have a lot of scripture. We're not going to read all of it this morning, but uh, we're going to give you the outline and the different passages, and much of that you can read on your own, and we hope that you will. But in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to 11, we see how the Christian love is affected by light or by darkness. Listen to what John writes. Brethren, I, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is from the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother, listen to this, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness, is in darkness until now. But he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What John is saying is that love and hate cannot cohabit. Light and darkness cannot cohabit. They can't coexist. A Christian who's walking in the light, and this simply means that he or she is obeying God and God's word, is going to love his or her brother or her sister or his sister in Christ. It can't be otherwise. You can't say, I love God and hate your brother or hate your sister. And not just, not just in your biological family, but in the family of God. In John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, we're told that Christians, Christian love is a matter of life or death. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. The word righteousness means rightness. Rightness. Right living. Right living. Walking in the light. So whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's not the mushy, mushy kind of stuff, you know, that you see at uh, the Oscars and someplace else where you come up and sort of whatever that is. He goes on to say, we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother, and why did he murder his brother? Why did he do that? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So John says, don't marvel, my brothers, if the world hates you. If we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers, he who does not love his brother abides in death. He abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love. Very important statement. You want to know what love is really like? John's going to tell us. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for each other. For each other. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? How does the love of God abide in him? So John says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him, for our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. 
And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is commandment that we should believe on the name of the Lord, on the Son of God and love one another as he gave his commandment. Now, who, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given to us. So John tells us in these passages, to hate one's brother or sister is literally to abide in death. You cannot go through life hating someone and be victorious in your life. Don't tell me you're on top spiritually if you're here this morning and your heart is riddled with antagonism towards someone, and especially a fellow Christian. You, can't, you cannot be victorious and maintain bitterness toward a brother or sister in Christ. In 1 John, another major passage, the writer shows us that Christian love is a matter of truth or error. It's a matter of truth or error. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. That's where it starts. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Wow. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. I'm doing a series on Thursday mornings at our men's breakfast right at the present time on the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm just so concerned that a lot of Christians are trying to live the Christian life in the, in the strength of the flesh and it just can't be done. But we have a guest who has been given to us, and he is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, your body, my body, is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit carries out so many different functions in our, in our lives. He leads us. He guides us. He blesses us with wisdom, and the list just goes on and on. And so we're really hammering it home on Thursday mornings at 6 o'clock. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love we love him because he first loved us if someone says I love God and hates his brother he's a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen how can he love God whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother or his sister. Not a suggestion. Not a suggestion. 1 John 4, 6, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Because we know God's love toward us, we're to show that love towards each other. Show each love, his love towards each other. Let's consider some of the reasons why, as Christians, we should love, we should love one another. Well, first of all, because God has commanded us to love each other. 
And in those three different passages that we read to you, he says it over and over and over again, that if, if we know him, if we know God, if we know Christ who is the Son of God, and if we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us as a Christian, which we do as a Christian, then we are to love each other. No question about it. And we've read those verses of Scripture, 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to 11. So we're to love each other because we are commanded to do that. Secondly, we have been born of love, and God lives in us. He lives in us. And we read that passage from 1 John chapter 3, verses 10 to 24. Do not marvel, my brothers, if the world hates you. And it will. And more so as time passes. We're seeing it over and over and over again. But he says here in verse 16, By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? This is a very interesting journey that Joyce and I are on at this particular point in time. Um, when we got married almost 55 years ago, uh, we repeated vows to each other. And uh, we meant those vows and we said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health until death do us part. But you know, when you repeat those vows, you're always thinking uh, for better and for richer and all the rest of it. <laughs> but uh, and we, we always think health and so forth. And many of you know our story that um, in our first year of marriage, uh, we had only been married a few months and Joyce became critically ill and they couldn't find out what was wrong. And uh, she went to the Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle and a whole team of specialists went over and uh, they couldn't find anything wrong. And so she came back and I'm watching her fade day after day. And we go back to our personal doctor and wonderful Christian friend. And, and he said, you know, um, sometimes all the tests of the world don't reveal what's really going on. And he said, for my own peace of mind, I'd like to do an exploratory. And uh, he explained, he said, there may be something going on that we're just not aware of. And he says, I don't want to take any chances, and would you consider it? And so we prayed about it and talked it over, and we decided, he says, it'll only take an hour and a half, but if I could go in there and take a look, I would know one way or the other. And so we agreed to it, and I still remember sitting with her folks in the waiting room an hour and a half went by and two and a half hours and three and a half hours and four and a half hours and finally he came back and he was crying. And he said, she's been sick for years. And uh, he said, she's got the worst case of endometriosis I've ever seen. And a few more weeks and she'd have been gone. I still remember the statement that he followed up with. He says, um, when she's recovered, she's going to have health like she's never known. And uh, we're still waiting for that. <laughs> but in the midst of all of that, God has been so faithful. And now we're in this next phase of uh, something that started about 11 years ago. We knew something had happened, but we didn't know what. But things were changing. And... and um, we finally got to see a, a neurologist by the name of Dr. Leonard. That's interesting. That ought to tell you something. <laughs> and anyway, uh, uh, he looked over the data and he said, uh, Joyce, I want to see you walk. Walk down that hall and then turn around and come back. And so she did. And he said, how many martinis did you have for breakfast? <laughs> well, if you know us, you know that we, we are teetotalers. And uh, we kind of laughed, and he said, uh, you've had a stroke. He says, I want to do a CAT scan or MRI of the brain, but he says, I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. And so we had it, and we came back 
a couple of weeks later and he went over the data and he showed us the x-rays and he says, you've had a bunch of them. But they were so small you weren't aware of it. But he says, here's the one right here that started this problem. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's in the deep part of the brain and all we can do is give you a little blood thinner and give you a lubricant to lubricate the blood vessels. And, and he says it's a progressive thing. And so it started 11 years ago and, and now we're, we're at the stage now where um, things are changing usually about once a week. And, uh, and in the midst of all of this, we are still seeing the faithfulness of God. We're seeing people bring us food. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're eating like royalty. And sometimes I'll say to Joyce, I'll bet you the queen didn't have chili for dinner. And, you know, it's just ham and all the rest of it. It's just incredible. And then someone the other day, they don't even go to church here, but they know about our situation, and uh, they sent us a check for $2,500. And uh, the list just goes on and on. And we're, we're seeing the faithfulness, and we're seeing the very thing that I'm talking to you about this morning, that if you love God and you know he loves you, you love one another. Now, Joyce deserves that kind of love. <laughs> Leonard is another story. He's another story. John, who's writing this, wasn't always a very loving person. He wasn't always a very loving person. In fact, at one particular point, he and his brother James were known as sons of thunder. They wanted, they wanted to call fire down from God on a Samaritan village. <laughs> and here's this guy who's writing about love. Love. We read here in Mark chapter 3, verse 17, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Monagares, that is, sons of thunder. And they wanted to call down fire from heaven to destroy a Samaritan village that was not receptive toward Christ. Luke chapter 9, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went. As, and as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Are you here this morning and you have seriously entertained calling down fire from heaven on a brother or sister in the family of God? Anybody has thought about doing that? But he turned, Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. I, I, I share that because I want you to know that the guy who was talking about loving your brother, loving your sister, loving one another, wasn't always that loving. <clears throat> but he is referred to as the one whom God loved or the one whom Christ loved. And obviously, associating with Christ over an extended period of time changed John's life. And if you are here this morning and you have spent much time with Christ, it'll change the way you feel about your brother or sister no matter what. No matter what. 
Some of the different aspects of love. In the Greek language, there are a number of words that are used for, for love. One is philia, which means, uh, it means a brotherly or a friendship kind of love. There's another word, eros. This is a sensual kind of love or erotic love. The strongest word, the strongest word of all is the word agape. And this is a commitment kind of love. This is the kind of love that God has for you and for me. He is committed to you, us. It describes God's love for us, a, a, a Christian's love for a fellow Christian and God's love for his church should be agape love. Ephesians chapter 5, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And if you're here this morning and you are married and you are not happy with your mate, especially to those of us who are men, we are commanded to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for us. And so you might, you might first of all decide, what kind of a wife do I really want? And to the degree that you give yourself to her as a man of God, in the same way that Christ loves you and me and gave himself for us, you'll have the kind of a mate you need. You'll have the kind of a mate that you need. Christian love, according to John, is both old and new. He says in 1 John chapter 2, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. And you might think, well, you said... We don't have a new one, but now you say you do have a new one. He says, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in Christ and in you, <clears throat> because the darkness is passing away. And the true light, Jesus Christ is that true light. He is that true light. And that light is already shining. That light is already shining. Love is not new, neither is the law. It's always been expected by God that we should love him and love each other. It's always been expected that we would. So in Mark chapter 12, Jesus took two Old Testament commandments and he put them together. Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. So he put these two commandments together and basically it says love of God and love of neighbor and he said that these two commandments summarize all of the law and the prophets. These were familiar and expected responsibilities before Christ ever came to earth. So it's old, but it's new. And he is the personification of it. Mark 12, it says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all. And Jesus said to him, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Folks, if you do that, there's not much left. We call that a total commitment. A total commitment. And he says, this is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbors yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Love of God and love of your brother and sister in the family of God. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. 
And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Those two Old Testament passages, Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your, all of your strength. And in Leviticus 19, 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God, God loves every person that's here this morning with a total commitment kind of love. He proved that when Christ died for us on the cross. He didn't have to, he chose to. He says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own choosing. I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. I lay it down, I take it up again. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. And he wants us to love each other with that same love. In his writings, John uses several expressions to help us understand the very nature of God. One of the things that John talks about is that God is spirit. He says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And then he says God is light. God is light, and this refers to the holiness of God. He says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then he says, God is love. God is love. And folks, love does not define God. God defines love. God defines love. Christian love is a special kind of love. Christ revealed that love to us. 1 John 4 says in this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. So because God is spirit and light and love that is born out of who he is, he wants you and me to show a love that is spiritual and holy. And the wonderful thing about this is that this love, this love that we are to manifest to each other is poured into our hearts, the Bible says, by the Holy Spirit who is given to one of my favorite passages of Scripture, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts, poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of love <clears throat> and he pours into your life, into my life, this agape love with which we are to love each other. In that same chapter, Romans 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So John is saying to you and me, if we are truly born again, if we really know God we are meant to be lovers. We are designed by God to be lovers. He says, let us love one another for love is of God. And the person who does not love does not really know God. Well, you've got the outline. You know the Lord. You have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and you have the book. It's all there. It's all there. If you immerse yourself in him and allow him to fill your heart, your mind, your soul, full to overflowing, you will not have difficulty in loving your brother or sister in the body of Christ. I can say without any hesitation that Christ's desire for Jubilee Fellowship is that we would love each other as he loves us. You believe that? Yes. It's absolutely true. And I believe that that's one of the things that is unique, unique about this fellowship is we have discovered 
in more than one way that God loves us. We are a church of his planting, and he wants us to pass it on. Let's pray. I just want to say to those of you who really know Jesus, if you're here and you have any kind of an issue, any kind of an issue with a brother or sister in the family of God, you deal with it. And you deal with it according to Scripture. You deal with it according to Scripture. You cannot harbor an issue toward a brother or sister and be victorious in your own personal life. But when you deal with it and you're reconciled to your brother or sister, a load lifts and you make room in your heart, your mind, your soul for, for fresh manna from God who loves you. If you're here this morning and you do not have a personal faith relationship with Christ, I want you to know God loves you. And he proved that. He proved that. That even though the Bible says the wages of sin is death, he sent his son to die in your place, to give his life on the cross, to atone for your sin. He waits to hear you open your heart and admit that you have a need for a Savior. He wants to come in, but he won't knock the door down. He'll knock on the door, but he won't knock it down. But he says if you'll open the door and invite him in, he will come in, and he will forgive your sin, and he will heal your life, and you will be ready as a child of God for whatever the future holds, and especially you'll be ready when he beckons you to come on home to heaven. And so I encourage you, if you've never done that, would you do it right where you're sitting? Lord Jesus, I know, I know I am a sinner. I know I've sinned. I also know I need a Savior. And this morning I believe Leonard when he says you love me and that Christ died for me. And Lord Jesus, I welcome you into my life right now. Father in heaven, as believers are covenanting with you to not let issues divide them, I pray that anyone here who is praying the sinner's prayer and inviting Christ to come in that they will sense that holy invasion of the love of God into their lives and they'll realize they are loved and they are forgiven and they are accepted and they are adopted into your family. And henceforth, children of God, go with us now, Father, throughout this day. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.